I never really watched TV because it was lame. This is the core philosophy of a show that 94% of the world population cannot properly watch. A show that will become one of the five most important and influential Latin American shows ever, if not Latin American media in general, when three entertainers set out to make a children's show that could be enjoyed by kids and adults alike after their producing company, Abla Black, won a contest to obtain funding straight from the Chilean government. A parody of a news broadcast network, delivered to Ryan's satirical humor and colorful <laughs> puppets that have now become iconic. This is 31 Minutos. This show would eventually give birth to what was at its time the most expensive Chilean film ever produced, as well as gaining worldwide recognition despite never being brought away or dubbed in any way. Which is cool because it's not that they didn't want to take the show outside of Latin America, but they simply couldn't due to the nature of its writing. There's just tons of commentary on different sociology, political and entertainment portrayal issues included in the writing, mostly relating to how manipulative news channels sometimes are. Which is surprising given the show is still directed at children and kids. The characters openly express that they are adults in the sense that they get drunk, gamble on firearms, and it is implied they have intercourse, though not with each other, that would be a little weird. Actually, there may be an instance where they managed to broadcast actual on-screen intercourse with literally no issues and they got rebroadcasted like that, which is incredible, so stick around to find out how. The point is, the characters having this element of goodness to the writing really helps squash the idea that these puppets are anything like the Muppets, despite remaining kid-friendly. The show prides itself on its ability to take complex thematics and present them in a way kids can understand. So before we get on with explaining how bold exactly this show can be, given that most of you will probably never be able to experience the show in its full splendor, allow me to talk a little about what the show is about and its wonderful cast of characters. The show follows these silly puppets who run a news broadcasting station, where they really actually broadcast any news as they quickly divagate to shenanigans or make their news around the shenanigans, shenanigans is just a funny word. It's a very unique show in terms of structure, and I don't mean Tullio's head shape, I mean how every episode has a plot surrounding the characters in a sitcom-like manner while fitting in apparent journalism related to said plot. So just one episode where the end of the world is literally announced on the show, so they quickly turn the broadcast into an end of the world special. Hola Teresita, ¿cómo estás? Un poco triste porque se acabe el mundo, pero feliz de poder salirme de la estricta dieta que inventé. Así que he decidido comerme todos los completos que pueda. Pero Teresita, te va a subir el colesterol. ¿Qué es eso? Se come. Ay. Uy, qué rico. You know. I don't laugh easy at jokes, yet I found this show insanely funny. The comedic timing is next to impeccable and it is capable of using a comedic setup to pay off multiple jokes throughout an episode. Jokes that I will note often serve as setups for further jokes, generating a feedback loop that makes the episode watching experience recording oh. engaging. You may recognize this as the method classic Simpsons use, hence why it's often regarded as good in the... Uh, oh, okay, hold on. Is that Subway Surfers? I mean, what the heck are you doing here? Go away! A portion of this can be attributed to how fun and engaging the personalities of the show are. I am aware, from first-hand experience, that well-built cast of characters facilitate the creation of interesting and engaging dialogue and events. Since you become capable of putting any two characters together in any situation and naturally find grounds for comedy or drama. At the very least, you can get audiences to ship them, which might not be a win for you, but people on Twitter are absolutely adoring it. So let me talk about some of these characters in detail. Uh, starting with my spirit animal, the reason behind my red ears, and the most important person in fictional media. Juan Carlos Bodoque. If they ever officially translate the show, hire me. This is not just a suggestion, it is a threat. Here, have a few clips of the characters so you can get to know them firsthand. I'm trying to keep the pros and mannerism of the characters, since I actually speak the language and cringe when they call avocado palta. People who speak Spanish probably found that amusing and the remaining 94% of you are confused. That's cool. Please enjoy it. Hola, Rosario! Como está, Rosario? Nunca había visto tanta caca junta. Fue un espectáculo impresionante. Usted se ha comunicado con el teléfono de Juan Carlos Bodoqui. Si él le debe dinero, este ya no es el teléfono de Juan Carlos Bodoqui. There's also that one time he got drunk and depressed and they explained his drinking habit as him drinking powdered juice and being intoxicated due to the chemicals it contains. But we'd be here all day if I played every Bodoqui clip. This guy has a gold mine, I swear. This is not actually the host, he's the co-host. And he has a segment called The Green Report where he explains different phenomena of nature and society. It's by far some of the most educational stuff in the show, which is amazing because it just opposes well with what Bodoki is outside of the Green Report. 
The dude spends his time running from debt collectors, gambling on a crappy horse, and physically attacking other employees of the show. These guys in the background, by the way, they are called staff, and constantly show up doing basically nothing in the background. It's a little silly. There's an explanation behind my love for Padaki and my desire to portray him in a dub, such as him being the catalyst of this beautiful ending for Judge's Bizarre Adventure Steel Ball Run, which I'm sure is going to overshadow the actual ending when it actually comes out. He's evidently a fan of indie and punk rock, which you can listen to during the Green Report segments. He once gambled everyone's Christmas money and has a full-on mental breakdown to the lyrics of Jesus Christ Superstar, which would be the only way I could actually perform Gethsemane with my inability to achieve the high note. And uh, yeah, basically it was mostly me making time while I raided a weapon that can fatally wound that Dark Mania clip. Little known fact, even for Spanish speakers, due to radiation at the studio, Bodoque has a reptilian tail. Hmm, I wonder if there are currently any characters in your screen right now with ears and tails of a different species. I also adore the lazy eye. Big character designed for a marionette. Let's move on to Tulio, the actual de facto host of the program with an eccentric personality as well as egocentricity issues. Despite earning over three times the amount his co-workers are, his reckless spender behavior and easy manipulability excuse stuff such as Baroque having cash despite his neuropathy. Tulio will be the first one to point out when the network has run out of reports and interviews, but goes along with it regardless because he is designed to be a professional. Con nosotros, el señor Invisible Mudo. Señor Invisible Mudo, buenas tardes. Pero señor Invisible Mudo, usted está acusando a una persona realmente famosa. ¿Se da cuenta de lo que está haciendo? Cuídese de un peligro inminente porque algo le puede caer en la cabeza. Patrañas. ¡Adiós! Oh, oh. ¡Pero Cindy! ¡Este programa es educativo y ama la naturaleza, te lo juro! ¡Aquí hay unos humanos! ¡Disparen! Tulio initially appears to be the straight man because he notices how ridiculous the situations are, but ultimately ends up including himself in the dynamic anyways. He kinda follows along with it and encourages its continuation regularly despite claiming to disagree with everything going on. Oftentimes he even is the instigator if it benefits him in some way, such as the educational episode he tried pulling as a form of flirt. I mean how his movements are inherently unique because two performers are necessary to play him. Notice how he is one of the two characters whose body is composed of two limbs and a head, as opposed to the usual stick control hands. Either way, as the host with Juan Carlos, they carry the show effectively in writing as well as in universe, though I suppose for the last criteria they do need assistance from the guy who organizes everything. Juanin. Bro is a slave to everyone working at the show, even in their past lives. He is also a white blob of wholesomeness and cuteness. Some people believe he is gay because he's soft and that bothers me because I have to indoctrinate my audience into sharing my exact headcanons. Juanin is asexual, no doubts. Not that it matters, Juanin Hanjari is wonderful because he is Juanin. Like of the species, Juanin. Juanin is a species and his name is Juanin Juanjari. That's that uh, honestly, Juanin Hanjari is a really good name. Estamos al aire! Estamos al aire! Estamos al aire! I must admit I'm not a massive enthusiast for Juanin. He is integral to the show as he easily allows for jokes to be stopped before they grow stale, making the insertion of unrelated jokes fit perfectly into the show. Juanin is abhorrent at his job, which results in the audience getting to witness much of what Tulio does before the cameras roll, as the announcer for the program being on the air is always incredibly delayed. So you'll encounter many jokes in between the commercials and the next segment thanks to Juanin, who is particularly good at aiding segmentation between the portions of the show. I love cute stuff, but I cannot certify Juanin as cute stuff, though I respect people who do. Y you know what I don't respect? The potential copyright issues that this goddamn Family Guy clip is doing just outside the frame and trying to get in, get out, get out! Of all the reporters in 31 Minutos, Mario Hugo is definitely the highlight. He is that one reporter who they send out in the middle of a hurricane to say that there is a hurricane wherever they are. He has a funny accent and a billion dogs. He also is himself a dog, so I'm not sure how that works, but whatever. Bueno, estoy aquí con unas importantes estrellas. Me voy a tomar una licencia, ya que es el fin del mundo. Este chaucha, yo no fui, adjetivo, copy copy, etc. Fierro machambulo, uniforme, moneda, rata. Señor, reality, refrito, pescado, calendario, jambón, maletín. Señor, señor, 
Mire mi globito. Cállate, niño, que estoy haciendo una nota. I mean, simply by being that guy, Mariogu is funny. He even manages his own segment called The Wonderful and Unknown Dimension, though it only had seven appearances. It's a little like Bodoke's Green Report, except the topics are a lot dumber, such as uh, the refined process of consuming an Oreo. He is both deadpan and ridiculous, the typical guy who has a leisurely conversation with the Sasquatch. Many of his interviews have him ask dumb questions to select people. He also has a crush on a co-star, Patana Treviño, who I will introduce now. Patana is Tulio's niece who was hired in the show because she basically pestered Tulio into giving her a position. And now she's a field reporter who is often the voice of reason with the pretty boys and at the same time could seriously consider murder because she's just mischievous like that. In truth, they added it halfway to the first season because the government asked for more female characters in the show, and thankfully it resulted in a fun character to contrast with the rest of the cast, who are sometimes clinically insane. Oh, usted es la maquilladora? Sí. As you can guess, she's immature and carefree, but at least she is an outright mean. Anywho, now her actress is kinda known for failing to deliver a feminist speech on national television, which is ironic when she performed for this show, which complains about this area of TV concurrently. Anyways, the important part is Patan once arranged a reality show about the food in her fridge and it arose as a gag but they ultimately commit. And honestly, what other show just turns a joke into a segment and keeps it fun? A few others, probably. And then they put these charges together and make them live off other people's misfortune. Which, yeah, probably they're ashamed of it, but you know, if something's news, there is no pain and it's the best. This one last people tell character in the main cast, Policarpo. He runs the ranking top, 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 top. Oof, sorry, I get one of those every time a civilization perishes. He runs the ranking top, where he presents the top three songs of the week, in the context of the universe, which means all the songs in the show are entirely original, and you'll get to listen to 20 seconds of a couple of songs every episode, with the winner actually showing up in full. For every season, they'd make like 10 to 30 songs or something like that, and they basically choose three and put them in the show every episode. This was a great technique to incentivize younger viewers to tune in again on later episodes so they can hear the full tracks. These tunes are not just catchy and renewed every season, but they also go to unexpected places on a daily basis. Now they're in the way of Arizona, also unexpected in the subjects they cover, such as my dolly spoke to me. Mi muñeca me habló, me dijo cosas que no puedo repetir, porque me habla solo a mí. Jury is still out on whether this girl has schizophrenia or if the doll is positively cursed. Or Tetrevni, which sounds like an Egyptian song but the lyrics are just inverted. Notice in the video how the singers have guns which are atmospherized? That is not government intervention. It's just a video director poking fun at MTV's pathetic censorship of firearms. Or even Inside World, a fantastic ska song about a turtle who cannot convince rabbits to join him within his shell, instead convincing a snail who shortly invites him into an acid trip. You have to mark this song as for kids. Then there's Lala, which is just... Lala. It has really high production value, holy crap. And I focus so much on the music because I figure it showcases the two main reasons why the show never made it outside of Latin America. The first is evidently the puns, as seen through the song Bailan Sin Cesar, which roughly translates to dancing endlessly. Now, that seems alright until the song reveals 15 seconds in that a person named Cesar exists and they are dancing without him. You could rename Cesar to something like End, but that's not a common name, or you could find some other porn. I tried, I couldn't. The pun would be substantially lost on like that official SpongeBob porn I was assaulted with the other day, and let's just say I ain't too happy about that. Or the song Guac, which is an idiom for gross, a word that has no synonyms that might be syllable in the actual song by any considerable means, resembling how I don't fit in any friend group I've ever set out to be in. Either way, puns are heavily utilized in the show's composition, and you'd have to either remove them or replace them with less interesting puns. The second is probably, you know, um, the inclusion of footage from Coup d'Etat's dictatorships and revolutions while a minuscule horse has a convulsion as it demonstrates what Twitter would become 10 years later as a form of education on free speech with political messages. There's subtitles available, by the way. I think this song actually has a name pun, but I couldn't figure out a natural name that means the same thing. Just goes to point out the pun's problem. Here, have a listen. Yo opino que opinar es necesario porque tengo inteligencia y por eso siempre opino. Yo opino que si opino un pensamiento que me venga a la cabeza hago crítica social. Yo opino de lo humano y lo divino y a veces digo cosas. 
Contino, mi opinión es opinal. Yo opino que el gobierno está en lo cierto y también equivocado, dependiendo de qué lado. Indeed, that was the Triple K and Hitler. Notice this other puppet that is constantly agreeing and the absurd complexity of I think's thoughts? It appears to be making light of what political opinions on TV involve, and how people's thoughts on different topics are more often than not simply present because of the human condition that is cognition, which makes us want to make opinions on people and topics we don't understand, which leads to opinions that are far too simple. Wanna know what my opinion on that mobile app that just showed up is? Because it's severely aggressive. See, the censors wouldn't tolerate a show directed at kids doing this outside of Chilean regulations. It's a genuine piece of art with intent to critique. Just look at those flanks of pure muscle. Wow. The closest anyone in the US ever got was Animaniacs trying to stand on the education entertainment border. But this is pure entertainment that is built from some philosophy, using art as a vehicle to excuse their boldness. Heck, even if the censors of other countries didn't have a problem, the culture in most profitable locations would result in backlash from illustrating this to kids. The Latin American culture surrounding what parents allow their children to observe on TV is a lot less restrictive and has a portion of realism, which means you can get away with... Honestly, there's so many ways to interpret this message, it could be a shrine in The Legend of Zelda. But I think the magnum opus of the show getting away with stuff through its music is definitely the on-screen sex that is shown in the music video for the literally named Doggy Style. This song was aired at a time where the internet was definitely being used by idiot goblins such as me. It was a search away for children to learn about sex, and thankfully I didn't fall for it. So let me show you clips from the music video. Uh, here they are lusting for the news broadcaster, here they are smelling their butts, here they are practicing cannibalism and dump a whole dog into their dinner. The song says they're just in bed, but I'm pretty sure they're having stuff going on down there. These dogs are into Wii Sports Resort waterboarding. Now that's a callback. Here they are smoking a cigar. And the rhyming includes a reference to this happening. It's very quick, but they did it. And uh, um, uh, yeah, the Spanish explains itself. The bug just came in that other dog's mouth. Let's instead think of the Kumbion version of this song that was officially released. And this is the power of 31 Minutos. Episodes dedicated to interviewees advocating a cult and a recurring segment about a sock with a rumble pattern that defends children's rights while combating against the schemes of an evil child slaver. It is as if Joker was kidnapping children instead of Batman. Evidently, this could not fly in most parts of the world. Too much of the show relies on the culture of the target geographies. They were allowed to misbehave precisely because they had nothing to worry about overall. They could simply call the more bold decisions art. Most changes made are simply there to remove Chilean idiomatics. Some networks outside of Chile censor the usage of ASS as an acronym, or explicit swear words for which I got grounded for as a goblin in kindergarten, but that's about it. Huh, crazy that if I went outside today, only the kinder bit of that description would disappear. I'm still pissed about that one, by the way. And you go away, subway surface! My shotgun has several rounds! I dare say, part of this is because the show blew out a plethora of records and attained so much recognition that no one truly cared about what they did, given that they did something. <coughs> No quality of social or political skepticism could manage to produce anyone who would so much as dare to make him flinch. They had the power. Partially because these abnormalities weren't centric to the show. I bring them up because they stand out, but they aren't over 2% of the entire show. Complex stuff is still taken and lowered to what a child can comprehend. They achieve their comedy, production and writing so well that they manage to sneak in all forms of tomfoolery. A standard that most shows with recurring attempts to be quote-unquote unhinged should strive to follow. The satire increments the value, yet is not the value. Except for one instance. Peloton is a fundraising event in Chile, a 27 hour long event that runs uninterrupted with the goal of obtaining donations to open and maintain their child rehabilitation institutes. This might sound familiar because everyone stole the idea around the 1960s due to how successful other Telethons were, but the point is that the Teleton Institute of Brain Children is a non-profit organization that specializes in helping disabled Chile. And when 31 Minutos was invited in 2003, they uh, put together what is basically a satirical hit piece on the organization. There are evident doubts about how fundraising events use donations, and Chile's Teleton is not exempt. The creatives at 31 Minutos found it deceptive, manipulative, and untrustworthy. 
Due to the show's ability to hide critique in plain sight as well as their branding being far more impactful than the contents of the product, no one actually checked their contribution, despite the fact that two minutes in, Bodoki begins manipulating the audience into transferring him money to his personal bank account, a major business proceeds to pitch in more than a grain of salt in the form of a wordless bag of sand, then the Teleton's mascot barges in with a gun to outbreak the man money, only to later reveal a scam artist is behind using the suit, a pointless artist that no one knows shows up, and of the two songs attached into the segment, among them is I Think. There were nine other pieces for them to select within their first season lineup, but they settled on this one for evident ulterior motives. After that, the organizer of the event is announced to show up, but rather, Badoki appears behind a cardboard cutout of said organizer to demand more cash. Tulio passingly mentions the judge he was invited to by this organizer, and here is the only time they actually cut out the number where the donations are received. Yeah, I gather you're not supposed to hear the number, right? At the end, they pull a YouTuber and extend their video to 10 minutes by pointlessly singing for a half a minute because the show is too long and no one is familiar with any of the upcoming performers. And not only did they avoid trouble for this thinly veiled critique of the event, but this actually got rebroadcasted several times. Just last year, they aired it again and even had a lady going doing the sign language thingy. It really brings forth how large numbers overshadow the contents of the publicity, which is a great additional critique that's bound from all this. 31 Minutos was massive and smart. The charge is relatable cartoons that were ridiculous enough to come off as endearing yet realistic, and the show's aim at entertaining children and adults alike completely shines through easily. This success led to 31 Minutos, the movie, a theatrical release that would become the most expensive production in Chile, and yet also one of the biggest flops. But hey, surely not as big as this knife which will soon be inserted into any suspiciously family-friendly android that's in the vicinity! Producing 31 Minutos was challenging, because you can't exactly obtain any old prop gun if a character is going to use a gun for a scene. You need to make everything to scale given the only two characters with human-sized hands are Tulio and Patana. Any items on a set such as TV screens, chairs and other props would require creation from scratch. Also, due to being a puppet show, most of it would need to be suspended one way or another. The producing cost of an episode was high. Now imagine a movie with visual effects taking place across Chile and Brazil with celebrated guests and a large government budget. The 31 Minutos movie was not cheap, and although the film was heavily hyped, tragedy stuck from an expected source, sadly. The production costs started to catch up to 31 Minutos, both the film and the show. Ultimately, the movie flopped and the show wasn't faring much better. The show cut their losses and decided on a movie to finish up the show. On a budget of $2.5 million, the highest ever seen for a Chilean production, only 1.2 was collected in the box office. Partially because producers outside of Chile were reluctant to support the movie, and the production cost far exceeded expectations. To add insult to injury, Apeplex suffered a thievery of their studio during the post-production phase of the film, which put the entire production company in peril as work had to divagate to other projects in order to make up losses. And despite coming back for a fourth season seven years later, the show didn't become any cheaper to produce. Simply put, 31 Minutos was too large of a project for Latin America and Apeplex amidst the critical acclaim of its fourth and final season. Cancellation was imminent, and further show production as a streaming series has only been discussed, but nothing's concrete. The production company is fairly certain that that is not a direction in which the franchise should continue moving on. 31 Minutos is currently free to watch full on YouTube, amassing half a million views every few days. Memes such as Anotelo Mario Ugoi, que? Como que no? are easily recognizable by a large portion of the internet users in Latin America, and there's also a lot of people shipping the character, which scares me greatly. And by the by, a few episodes have been fully subtitled into English. Note the franchise is alive and kicking. They still release music albums in the setting of the show and they have become a sensational success doing live tours throughout Latin America, which are far more profitable. Heck, roughly a year ago their concert had me stuck in traffic for a bit. They've produced several awareness campaigns and released demos, b-sides and instrumentals of different tracks you might have heard sometime playing in my videos. Also a Portuguese dub, so I guess the title is Void now? Let's pretend not though. You can tell it's the kind of product that cares about being fun. Recall the starting quote from this video. I never watched TV because it was lame. The producers fundamentally believed that viewing TV wasn't fun. Among all the political and market-based programming blocks, there was no room for creativity. Children were not allowed to learn about topics of any complexity, and 31 Minutos forever serves as a reminder of what makes entertainment entertaining, what makes children want to learn. This is the principal feature for which 31 Minutos is distinguished. 
fun. It's a show that connected its core with fun intrinsically, proficiently carving a direct path to their ideal of fun and constantly utilizing it. They would find a way to make people watch TV by turning it awesome, eradicating the lame. Make the TV present you with narratives that go untold at school, showcase whatever your parents appear to adore in understandable manners, and notably, make it unafraid to stare you in the eye and showcase what enjoyment for fiction means, as well as remember that children aren't lobotomized worms. This is a golden standard that I have plenty of appreciation for. As someone who makes videos on the internet, I desire to be entertaining. I wish for my content to have value, both logical and entertainment. I harbor pure admiration for 31 Minutos as it informed me to what genuine valuable entertainment is. It managed to make me ponder. Why does fun matter? Why are the films we watch and the stories we listen to noteworthy? Could it be a mere misconception to think media has to select whether it wants to be profound or awesome with no in-between? Given being awesome by definition implies the lack of complexity. There can be no such thing as media that is both. But consider that the rabbit hole can go deeper. Why have we assumed awesomeness is superficial? Everyone I've spoken to of this has always understood awesomeness as an station of shallowness, this attribute that has begun permeating entertainment in the age of social media. The subway surfers and the family guys that appear adjacent to the focus that has now become nothing but an excuse. Do audiences truly care about the content or are they only seeking a cause to be stimulated? I need answers. There's no chance that Entayu Minutes is entertaining on such blunt grounds. I demand proof that awesomeness can overlap with substance. And this very video, right here, will become the experiment. Do you really think I'd be as silly as to put this stupid footage as a ploy to maintain your attention? You probably don't know me at all. I mean, did you notice that almost every instance of these was about 30 seconds after a translated grip? This is a test. The proof I wanted. See, I know when people usually tend to leave my videos, and I know YouTube itself provides these wonderful graphs that show when exactly people left, so I'll be using that to my advantage. This was not a joke, it was a trap. Which of these two will keep the internet engaged? Does the content within the entertainment matter, or have we genuinely reduced ourselves to viral blobs of colors and shapes we vaguely recognize? Allow me to find out and truly understand the value of entertainment. That or I just ruined the video's retention within the first 5 minutes and this video won't break 2,000 views despite the fact that someone covered this exact topic a month ago while at my size, does not actually know Spanish and simply uses a proxy, went on circles for 40 minutes while applying their headcanons to every single character and still got about a million- How delightful. Some fried chips. A good wine. Nobody to bother me. It is the perfect night.